Well, as so many people on other podcasts are fond of saying, I feel like we're in a new golden age of Star Trek right now. There is so much Star Trek to talk about with Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Lower Decks, and three series going into production right now. Like, it's crazy. So we're here to talk about all of that Star Trek in a positive manner. My name is Dan Gunther. This is Positively Trek. And with me, of course, is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how are you doing today? How can you say this is a golden age of Star Trek if we have to pay to watch it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have to sit through, I don't have to tune in at a specific time on a specific channel, sit through commercials, make sure I'm home at a particular time. And, you know, if something comes up, I just don't see Star Trek that week. People don't remember what Star Trek was like in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So speaking of, yeah, I remember it being on, I think it was Saturdays where I lived and it, I would record them. I typically watched them live when they aired, which uh, they moved over time, different time periods, but it was either late in the afternoon or early evening is typically when they were on and I'd watch them live, but I also would record them on my VCR so I could watch them again later. But if for some reason I couldn't be home when they were on, I had to make sure that that VCR was set up to record. Mm -hmm. And then invariably there'd be some baseball game that would go 15 minutes over. So you'd miss the last 15 minutes of the episode because, you know, oh, things like that happen to me all the time. Because, yeah, I did the recording on VHS tape of every episode as well. Yeah. And if I was home to watch it live, you know, you could pause it and, and not record the commercials. But, you know, if you weren't home, you just had all the commercials and like all of this stuff. Oh, it the was crazy. pausing the commercials. I used to do it, but not with Star Trek, but before that, whatever I would record. There was a time where I did that. And after a while, I was just like, this is a pain in the butt. I'm just going to fast forward through the commercials when I <laughs> watch it on VHS instead of keep pausing and unpausing, you know, because every once in a while you think you unpaused and it didn't for some reason. Maybe you didn't hit the button well enough, you know, it's, it's yeah, a little dangerous. Yeah, or you'd... you'd You'd fumble with the remote control and miss like the first five seconds or something because you right. couldn't find the button correctly or something. Right. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's weird because, you know, here in the States having CBS All Access, there's commercials, but you can pay more for CBS All Access and not have commercials. And I pay the extra money to not have commercials. So it's weird when I see somebody or hear somebody say about, you know, you know, and then the commercial break came and I'm like, what? Oh, yeah. Ooh, I can't imagine watching it with commercials. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. No, I watch it on Crave here in Canada. And the one drawback is that it comes out on, on Friday evenings on Crave. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sometimes I can I can you know, borrow my parents CTV sci fi channel. Uh, subscription and watch it that way but yeah usually i'm watching it later than most everyone else unfortunately but uh yeah so your parents can watch it before you do yeah they don't though <laughs> 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 no my mom pvrs it and she's actually we're she's not done season two yet so i've told her do not watch season three <laughs> <laughs> because right. it will give too much away. Yeah, but it, I know we're kind of getting on topic of things, but that's the purpose of the show is talk anything Star Trek. But I have talked to some people who have never seen Discovery before but are watching it on broadcast CBS because, you know, mm -hmm. here in the States, they're now showing season one on CBS. And I've actually talked to some people that go, hey, Bruce, yeah, you watch that show. Discovery. I've been watching that now on CBS, you know, because they're not big Star Trek fans, but, but it's there. They're now, quote, discovering it. You know, so it's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And, you know, anything that gets this in front of more people's eyes, I think the better, because I've heard from a lot of people and a lot of people who weren't big Star Trek fans as well, who, you know, have found it here in Canada on CTV sci-fi or Crave and friends I've known for years who are not Star Trek fans like you have come up to me and been like, hey, Dan, you, you, you like Star Trek, right? I've been watching that new one. It's really good. So yeah, there's a lot of love for it out there. Yeah. And uh, I, I never wore glasses before, but you know, I'm getting older and whatever. So I decided because sometimes things that are far distance, I have to kind of squint to read something like, you know, in a fast food menu or watching a PowerPoint presentation at in an office meeting. But anyway, I got these uh, progressives glasses that I have to adjust my eyes to. So I have to wear them nonstop for a couple of weeks. And this is day two 
And anyway, when I went to get them, the guy that was working on my glasses saw my phone and it had the Federation emblem on it. And he's like, so uh, I noticed your phone there has got Star Trek on it. So you watch the new Discovery? I'm like, heck yeah, I watch the new Discovery. And then we started talking about Discovery. So it was pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that almost sounded like, you know, something was wrong. It's like, oh, you got some Star Trek on your phone there. Uh, you might want to wa- wipe that off. Yeah, get that <laughs> off of there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we've got a bunch of news things to talk about this week, some interesting developments in the Star Trek universe. And the first one that I wanted to bring up is related to another sci-fi show that's going to be resuming soon. The Mandalorian from the Star Wars universe, of course, is coming back on October 30th. But they've kind of introduced this new technology for shooting scenes that is kind of making waves in Hollywood, this AR wall to create virtual sets. So, you know, we're all very familiar with the use of green screen to create virtual sets and backgrounds and environments. But what the Mandalorian has done is they have these LED screens that are, that actively display the environment around the actors that they're acting in which, you know, has a number of benefits. For one thing, the actors can see what they're reacting to much better than, you know, a green screen or some guy with a tennis ball on a stick that's like, oh, this is a big monster or whatever. But what's interesting and how this relates to Star Trek is apparently Alex Kurtzman has expressed interest in acquiring this technology for Star Trek productions. And of course, there are three live action Star Trek shows going into production over the coming months. And the idea of using this technology on Star Trek, I think it's a perfect fit and would be really interesting. I'm so thrilled. By the way, you put this in the notes. I hadn't even looked at this. I didn't even know about this until we're now talking about it. So yeah, I'm also a big Star Wars fan. Don't tell anybody, but you know, Star Trek just edges it out, okay? But (laughs) I'm a big Star Wars fan. I do watch The Mandalorian and which by the way season two comes out this friday but on disney plus but here's the thing that wall which they call the volume is incredible if you go to disney plus there's a documentary series in there i can't off the top of my head remember what it's called but you'll find it just search for mandalorian you'll find this documentary series that shows the it's in one of the episodes but they go in detail for about a half hour about this thing called the volume these these vr walls and it's incredible i had no idea when i watched season one of mandalorian that they were using this technology i was thinking that they were doing a lot of on location shots and here to come to find out they're in a studio so yeah it's not a green screen or a blue screen that they're putting these actors on they're in a studio and all around them those screens just light up with the location and when they interviewed the actors they said they felt like they were there you know because when you're in front of a green screen there's nothing like you said a tennis ball or whatever they feel like they're actually on location but they're not and then the lighting above it and the lighting around it if it's an outdoor scene and it's bright in the desert that lighting also lights the actors so the environment is lighting the actors in the same manner as if they were outside. It's incredible technology. I'm so thrilled to hear this because it's really going to open up Star Trek Discovery and the other series. And, and you're, and you're going to be amazed. You're going to think they're actually at these locations when they're not. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And it even uses like gaming engine technology, like the engines that drive a lot of the, the video games that mm-hmm. uh, are popular out there. Like that's kind of where this technology's come from. And I, I think that's so cool. Like, I, I don't know, my my biggest uh, knowledge of that is like the Unreal Engine. I'm sure they're well past that now, but that's kind of where my <laughs> my knowledge base for that is. But, you know, just the idea of that technology being used live on a studio soundstage to create environments. I think that's brilliant. And it's so cool that we're at the point where that can be done realistically now. You know, uh, the the photos, of course, in this story show the Mandalorian on set on this icy world. And I think that's from the first episode of The Mandalorian, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and it looks like, you know, if you frame it a particular way, it looks like he's actually there. And I feel like as an actor as well, that would 
just helps so much with the performance. Absolutely. And by the way, I looked it up. It's called Disney Gallery. That's the series right. on Disney+. Thank you. Plus. I, kn- I was like, I know, I can't remember exactly what it is, but Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian. But check that out because that technology is very interesting. And the thing I would love to do is actually walk on the set of one of these. Can you imagine, Pick just picture a realistic location on Star Trek and walking in a studio and feel like you're actually there. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about, oh, a bridge set. You know, we've been on bridges at, you know, STLV and other things or Star Trek experience, but like a locate, like Vulcan. Imagine walking and you feel like you're actually standing on the planet. Yeah. It's, it's close to the holodeck. Like it that's is. interesting. Yeah. You know, like someday shows will just be filmed on the holodeck, you know, because you can create anything there. And this is, I think, a step in that direction. That's really cool. Yeah, and I remember watching this technology thinking that same thing. Oh my gosh, it's a holodeck. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so yeah, it looks like Alex Kurtzman has said they, they're acquiring one of these walls and it will be used in future Star Trek productions. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, we've got some other news with regards to Star Trek, not productions, but rather some collectibles that people can be picking up and the Star Trek Eagle Moss collections, there's something that, you know, I have a number of ships in. I, I've kind of stopped collecting those because there's so darn many. But uh, one thing that I have been getting is the ships in the Star Trek Discovery Starships line. Uh, and it looks like the Star Trek Discovery collection is going to be stopped after issue number 33. But what they're going to do this over at Eagle Moss is fold that into a new chapter of the official Starships collection. And this is going to feature ships from all of the ongoing Star Trek Universe live action series. So this new collection is going to feature ships from Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Strange New Worlds. And that collection is going to start in April of 2021. The biggest question I have, this uh, article from Trek Core does address it. And I'll have a link to that in the, in the show notes. Uh, ships from Star Trek Lower Decks. It looks as though that's still being developed. They're not yet included in this new line of ships. Uh, I do like that it's the Star Trek Universe Starship Collection, so they could just fold that into that at some point instead of creating a whole new line. So hopefully that happens. But we do have listings for the first four ships of that collection, and the first four are all from Star Trek Picard. So the first one is one that I've been wanting to get my hands on, and that's a model of the of Chris Rios's ship, La Serena, which I've really wanted a model of this ship since first seeing it on screen. I was just looking at this thinking, I don't have a single Eagle Moss ship. And I'm like, but I feel like I need to start getting them. I mean, I've always admired them. But now I saw this one. I was like, oh, I really want that. I I mean, this isn't a favorite ship of mine, but it's just so different. And I love the Mm. color, the red and the white. So striking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Gosh, can you get these just individually or do you have to subscribe and get all these different ships? You can get them individually. What I've done in the past is talk to your local comic store dealer. I'm assuming it will be the same for this. Uh, They'll be able to order in for you, especially with through, you know, the the previews ordering system. I'm not sure exactly how that all works, Uh but I have had them order in specific ships for me. Okay. All right. Well, that's if my comic book store is even open now. I guess they are. I don't know. I haven't been in forever (laughs) since COVID. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully, you know, things will look a little different April 2021. So you never know. That's true. But yeah, La Serena is the first one. The second one after that is uh, the Romulan Bird of Prey. I love this one too. the (laughs) episode Absolute Candor. Yeah, the kind of updated TOS Romulan Bird of Prey with the, the... hull plating and the green accents and highlights gorgeous ship it is now i okay i shouldn't be looking at these because now i want them all and i don't (laughs) i don't want them i mean i want them all and i don't because i just don't know where i would put them all (laughs) that's my problem right now i've got so many of them already i've I've got to box them up and and make more room for other stuff There's, there's just so many yeah i just i just need to find a friend nearby that has these so i can go over and play with them (laughs) <laughs> if we lived closer, you could absolutely come play with mine. <laughs> <laughs> 
So after that, the third one, we've got Seven of Nine's Fenris Ranger Vessel. This is a really interesting design and one that I had never really seen up close. I didn't even realize it was this weird asymmetrical design. That's kind of cool. I don't know. This maybe not high on my list, but, you know, pretty cool. Not high on mine either, but, I mean, it is pretty cool. But to your point, I was thinking the same thing. This is a good chance to really get a good look at some of these ships that we haven't been able to do in the series. And speaking of ships that we didn't get a really close look at, but this last one I'm really interested in, the fourth one in the collection is the USS Zheng He, which was the ship commanded by Riker at the end of Star Trek Picard, as he called it the toughest, fastest, most powerful ship Starfleet ever put into service. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that one. I love Federation ships. Like that's most of what my Eagle Moss collection is, is whenever there's a Federation starship, I have to grab it. <laughs> so are we going to get the whole fleet of these class of ships? <laughs> because there are a whole bunch of them. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of them. Apparently, according to the people that worked on the visual effects, there were four different variations of the ship in that fleet. Yeah. So there's small differences between them all. It looks like the one that we're getting is just the, the Zheng He, the one that Riker was commanding, uh, and not the other three variants, which is probably a good thing because I don't think the differences were big enough to really convince a lot of people to buy multiple models of them. But there are collectors out there that will, of course, get all of them, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember freeze framing that and noticing, oh, yeah, there are some slight differences between the ships. Not, mm -hmm. Nothing really huge. So yeah, there's a bunch of other releases in the Star Trek collection. The XL line with the, the extra large ships continues. And apparently uh, we've got a couple announcements there. The Kelvin Timeline Enterprise and the Delta Flyer are both coming out in extra large versions. Uh, we've also got for $200... If you really want to pick this up, there's a gold-plated special edition of the extra-large-sized Enterprise-D model, which is a convention special announced as part of the virtual New York Comic Con events. I personally don't have $200 to spend on this, but if you out there do, all the power to you. This looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... I I don't think I'd want a gold-plated Enterprise. I like the Enterprise to look like the Enterprise, the same coloring. I don't want it all in gold, but, you know, it would be, if you have, like, an, a collection of something or, or of expensive things and gold items, this would look great with that. Yeah, I think in, like, a nice display case, if it was, like, a centerpiece thing, yeah, that, that would yeah. be pretty cool, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I personally, every once in a while, take my Eagle Moss ship models off the shelf and zoom them around a little bit. I would love to see you run around the house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are some uh, other Eagle Moss releases. Uh, the Star Trek Online collection, of course, continues. Not one that I've really been into. I'm more into the canon ships and stuff, but I'll have a link in the show notes that you can check this out. There's a story on Trek core that kind of outlines all of the releases. So uh, I'll leave that for you, but uh, definitely interested in the star Trek universe ships collection and these ships from Picard that I've been excited to see. And uh, hopefully we hear something about ships from lower decks. Cause I would love a Cerritos and a Vancouver on my shelf. I think. Yeah, I just have to d make a decision. If I'm going to get one, which one? It's going to be hard to pick, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm just looking down here. You know, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of other little, like, shuttles and yachts, and there's a bunch of things. So, yeah, everybody needs to check it out. It's not, it's one thing to listen to us talk about. It. You really need to just look at them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, something that translates a little better to the audio medium rather than visual, although we also can't play music as well as, as show you um, ships and stuff. Huh? How's that for a segue? Uh, I love it. We've learned that Star Trek <laughs> Prodigy has their new composer, Nami Malumad, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm really not sure how to pronounce her name, but she has been named as the composer who will be composing the score for the new Nickelodeon kids series, Star Trek Prodigy coming in 2021. So this is a first for Star Trek, the first woman composer who's uh, leading the score for a Star Trek series. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I notice here that she also did the soundtrack to American Pickle. And I that's one thing that I am familiar with. I did watch that. So, uh, but the other things, other movies or series that she's done, I haven't watched any of those, 
But yeah, I mean, I'm just excited to hear. I want to hear the music now. I mean, I guess it's not available. I hope they do like an early release of the music at some point before the series, just so we can get a little used to it. I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Prodigy is something we've not seen in Star Trek before, which is an animated series geared specifically towards kids. So I'm wondering what the soundscape for that will sound like. Like, I'm really curious to, to hear what kind of environment they're creating for that. Uh, we have heard her musical talents in Star Trek before. She did do the music for the short Trek episode Q and A. So, you know, if you want to kind of refresh her on some of her talents, check out that episode. Well, see, then I haven't heard her music because I, I never watched that short Trek. Hmm. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> I've seen it many times. Yeah, oh, so I have. So outside of American Pickle, I've have heard on Q&A. So, yeah, now I want to go back and listen to that music again. I want a soundtrack to all the short tracks. Mm -hmm. That would be great to have. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I, I did really like the music specifically in that episode, too. I'm thinking back. So mm -hmm. um, although maybe I'm just remembering uh, number one singing Pirates of Penzance. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, Namie wrote that. No, I, I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we'll definitely be looking forward to checking out her music and the rest of the show, of course, in 2021. No release date specifically for Prodigy yet, but uh, it will be releasing, as they say, sometime in 2021 and starring Kate Mulgrew as Catherine Janeway reprising her role. No other casting announcements yet for Prodigy, but we, of course, will bring you that news as we learn it. So I'm excited. I am too. And we've heard from people in the know, uh, David Mack specifically. He is very impressed with what he's seen of this series. And, you know, anytime it's brought up, he says it's some of the best Star Trek he's ever uh, had the pleasure of, of seeing or reading. So I'm, I'm really curious to see what this looks like. Yeah. It's going to be very different for us, but I'm excited for it. Well, we've got some book news as well. And this, you know, we record these episodes on Saturday mornings generally. And as I woke up this morning, getting ready to record this news came across the desk. I got it in the show just kind of at the last minute we have an announcement of a new Star Trek Picard novel, and we knew that, you know, this was coming in January, but we have the cover and a kind of brief description of what this novel is. So it's Star Trek Picard, The Dark Veil vale by James Swallow. And if you read this description and look at this cover, it is actually a Star Trek Titan novel masquerading as Star Trek Picard. No way. I am so excited about this. <laughs> okay. I haven't seen this. I still haven't clicked on the link. Oh. I just, I want, I'm listening to you. I'm reacting to what you're telling me. Oh, okay. My so now I'm clicking on it now. So here's, here's going to be my reaction. Of course, I'm going to love this, but oh, wow. Right? Okay. Yeah. What? It is it like, oh, wow. It is a Titan novel, but Picard. Yeah. Because, okay. Yeah. I'm. Let me take it in as you talk. <laughs> so we have cover art for this, which apparently might not be the final cover art, but I hope it is because it's absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of this, this painted look of Riker and Troy, and they're wearing the uh, Star Trek Picard flashback uniforms that we see that Pic Admiral Picard wears with Raffi in a couple episodes. And apparently this takes place aboard the USS Titan during the attack on Mars. So we don't have a back cover blurb or anything like that yet, but uh, this looks to be really interesting and, and all about, of course, Riker on the Titan with Troy with him there. So, you know, this time period that, of course, we've been expecting they'll be filling in with these novels. So, you know, my... My expectation, my first thought was that the first new Picard novel would be a Seven of Nine adventure, talking about her backstory, but I'm absolutely thrilled to be getting a Riker Troy novel here. Wow. I have a lot of feelings going through my head. Not feelings, thoughts, but feelings from the thoughts, I should say it that way. But okay, so this is interesting. James Swallow is writing this, and Mr. Swallow has also written to... Star Trek Titan novels. So he's very familiar with the Star Trek Titan novel line, which makes me think, well, now he's approaching this, and I know it's a different timeline or continuity or whatever 
you want to refer to it as. But I have to imagine that he may work in some elements from the novel verse into this. And if he doesn't, he better call me because we need to have a serious talk. <laughs> yeah, I've got to imagine the same thing, like whether it's, you know, a few characters or what have you. But the the one thing that I was thinking while I was looking at the story is, of course, the design of the Titan and the way it looks as seen in Star Trek Lower Decks is now kind of canon, right? So uh, yeah, that, that whole idea of the Titan as it was in the novel verse, that has been brought forward. So I don't see why other elements from those books couldn't be brought forward as well. And I, you know, I'm really curious to see what he does with this. Well, yeah, because I mean, first of all, I want to see Vale there. Now, if for some reason she's not first officer or she's or something, I would just like, I don't know. I just want to see her there because when I think Titan, I think of Vale. I think of Riker, but I think of Vale. I also think of Troy. But I also wonder if he would put Tuvok in there. I mean, will they let him do that? I mean, in a lot of ways, why not? I don't know. It's just there's certain elements because talking about these types of franchises, you know, Star Wars, they stop the continuity in the novels and call them now legends. Though when they're making new Star Wars books and things, they are borrowing elements from the legend line. So I can see Star Trek doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here hoping. But you know what? Let me just say this. If that doesn't happen, it's not like I'm going to hate on the book or hate on James. Because James is a great guy. (laughs) But, you know... I will say this, though, I will be a little disappointed, but if it's a good book and I might, it doesn't matter, but I'm just saying it would really thrill me if they worked some elements in. Yeah. That's all. I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are definitely not done talking about Star Trek novels because we also have kind of a bit of the uh, book release schedule for 2021. Uh, Thanks to the folks over at the Trek Collective, they've kind of put together a brief list going through July of next year of the book releases that we can see. And, you know, we know the names of some of these, but some of them are a little bit of a mystery because we just kind of get the acronyms from the pre-order pages on Amazon. But as we did just learn, the first one coming in January is, of course, the Picard novel, The Dark Veil by James Swallow. So that's in January. In April... We have SHO, which is a TNG novel. And this, of course, we have had their name released of as well. That's Shadows Have Offended. Uh, That's the one being written by Cassandra Rose Clark, focusing on Deanna Troy, Dr. Crusher, and Worf. But then we have a Discovery novel coming in May, DTP. And no name has been revealed about this one yet. So uh, excited about a new Discovery novel coming next year in May. Yeah, I mean, of course, I assumed we were going to see a Discovery novel coming, but uh, now we know it's May, so that's good. That could change, though. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I'm a little disappointed in we've got January, then it jumps to April. Yeah, so we've got a two-month gap there between the Picard and TNG novel, but maybe something else will fill that in. But, yeah, a Discovery novel in May would be nice because we'll be done with season three, and we're going to need a Discovery fix by that time. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, the following month, June of 2021, we have a TOS novel. And again, we've not had the name released of this one. OATW is the acronym. So I don't know if we can come up with (laughs) something that might fit that, but I don't know. My ad-libbing skills are a little rusty this morning. I don't know. OATW, any ideas? I'm going to say the W means world. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm fixated on W being world. Some, the world. Something at the world. (laughs) Ogling at the world. It's people looking out of viewports at planets, I guess. (laughs) Or to world. It could be something to, no, I don't know. I'm probably totally way off. Well, the following month, July 2021, this one we do have more details about. This is presumably the novel Revenant by Alex R. White about uh, Jadzia Dax and Kira Norris. And that's, yeah, coming July 2021, Deep Space Nine novel. I'm very excited about a new DS9 novel. And presumably because it's Jadzia Dax, like we've mentioned before, is set during the series. 
Yeah, I was hoping this was coming out earlier than July, but hey, I'll take it. Yeah, to get a DS9 novel, that's exciting. And, you know, going back, I'm looking at the Discovery DTP. I just I figured out what that stands for. Oh, yeah? Dis- Discovery Toilet Paper. Ah, huh. okay. All right. I haven't figured... Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Culber's efforts to market a new Starfleet branded of... of Discovery Toilet Paper meets with obstacles when the Starfleet head branding office contacts him for copyright infringement. That's what the wow. that's what it's all about, I think. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll be of course talking about all of those novels on the Positively Trek Book Club. Speaking of which, we have an episode of that coming out later this week that will drop on Friday. We will be talking about the Star Trek Voyager novel To Lose the Earth, a new novel by Kirsten Beyer. And joining us on that show is the author herself and writer for Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Picard, Kirsten Beyer. So excited to have her on the show. And uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. She had a lot of available time. Because she's not doing much. Yeah, no. Totally open schedule. She was so glad to hear from us and said, guys, I haven't talked to a single person in months. You're the first (laughs) people I've even... (laughs) Of course not. (laughs) But no, she's been very busy, but she was very gracious to take the time to speak to us. And she even said it was a crazy week, but this was one of the highlights of her week. So she was very happy to dig into this novel with us. And it was a great conversation. Yeah, I definitely can't wait to bring that to all of you. And the novel itself, if you haven't picked it up and read it, you know, it's kind of the culmination of these last however many years that Kirsten has been writing the Voyager relaunch. I've said before, Voyager, not my favorite of the Star Trek series, but this book series has been a consistent highlight of the Star Trek novels over the past couple of decades. So I absolutely encourage all of you to pick up that book and give it a read. It's it's great stuff. So I hope you can join us for that episode. And she gives us little hints about where the novel verse is going. You know, so we get a little bit of that in there. Well, hopefully you can check out that episode and all of our other book club episodes. Those come out every two weeks on Fridays. So keep an eye out for them and they're color coded red. So that that'll help you differentiate the episodes in your podcast feed. And we have Una McCormick coming up soon. Yeah, excited about that one. The autobiography of Catherine Janeway is due out on October 27th. So that's the same day this episode drops. So be sure to pick that up if uh, if you haven't already pre-ordered it. We'll definitely be talking to the author about that in an upcoming episode as well. And Greg Cox, we haven't, we haven't scheduled anything with him, but we're hoping... Greg has time to talk to us about his TOS novel. So there's a lot going on in the next month or so. Yeah, definitely. Lots to see and do and read in the Star Trek universe, and we'll be talking about it all. So thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode. I've been Dan Gunther. You can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can find me on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions. And you can find the show at Positively Trek on Twitter, on Instagram, Positively Trek there as well. And on Facebook, find our discussion group and join up. We'd love to have you there. And you can find me on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex and occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast. Excellent. Well, we'll see you in the next episode. Like I said, our book club episode with Kirsten Beyer. Really excited about that one. Please join us for it. And until then, as always, stay positive. Stay positive.